and I'd actually reversed up to the door of Bernie's motorhome. So I'd actually technically blocked in Bernie if he was, if he'd been in, he wouldn't have been able to get out. You know, I couldn't say that Carlos Sainz hates Lando Norris when I know he doesn't. Um, <laughs> like that sort of thing. But, you know, some, some of the lines were things like that. Or it turned out my course leader was best mates with Jonathan Ledyard, who was BBC commentator at the time. And I think for a lot of people, they think qualifying's over, TV show ends an hour after qualifying, everyone's done. Um, and we're working for a good five, six hours after that. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, like and subscribe, five stars, all that good stuff. Welcome back to The Cool Down. My name's Tomo. Today's guest is someone I've wanted on for a very, very long time because he is the man. If you want up-to-date F1 news, you have to follow Chris Medland, obviously. Chris is a freelance F1 broadcaster journalist who's been working in F1 for over a decade now, and we had such a a good chat. This could have easily gone over two hours. There's a reason this is a particularly long one because he's just quality. We discussed his journey, getting to where he is now in work, his little feature on Drive to Survive and how that propelled him to stardom, basically. And he's got so many insights and cool little stories from his journey, from his decade in Formula One. This one is quite the treat. The Cool Down Podcast, episode 24, Chris Medland. Chris, mate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. I've already coined the name Fabrizio Remedland. I think that's <laughs> that's what I'm going to be calling you throughout this podcast, mate. Um, first of all, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm better to have you on the podcast. And, and today was a perfect example because we're filming this. It's currently 33 minutes past four on Thursday. And the news just dropped, Alpine, Martin Bukowski. And who was the first person? You, Fabrizio. Was I? Fabrizio, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the first person I saw on my Twitter anyway to post about it. Well, that helps. Maybe you're just not following enough people. I, I, know, I, know, all, I know everyone now. All right? I've got all the connections in the game, okay? <laughs> but it's you. It's always you, Chris, who pops up first. You've heard this before, haven't you, this comparison, right? Yeah, I, I get a bit lucky with it, I'll admit. So... This, this genuinely comes from with the fact that I work for an American website, mainly mm. like my news writing. Quite often, stuff that happens on European time zones mean I don't need to like go instantly into writing the story. Like, the first thing I can do is tweet about it and kind of explain it a bit, and then I can worry about the story. So, um, yeah, just it meant my Twitter following kind of grew from that. And then, obviously, the end of the season, the last few races, with all the decisions we were waiting for from the FIA at different times, mm. um, I, you could just, you know, you get an email to your inbox. It's quite simple for us. Like if you're a fully accredited de- journalist, you get decisions to your inbox. Okay. When it lands, tweet the result. Um, but different people will be in different places. Uh, yeah, just, man, I, I don't know. I just kind of make it something that I try and do because people want to know what's going to happen or what's happened. And then I can worry about writing the story for them to know more, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. That's kind of, that's kind of why I do it. But um, yeah, a few of uh, of. Uh, likened me to Fabrizio which has been quite cool but I am nowhere near his level I mean the insight he has is totally different like I'm just telling you what an email says he's going you know <laughs> this this move's about to happen that nobody else knows about he's got the proper insight you've just got the quick fingers that you can just quickly get it knocked up bosh essentially yeah yeah that's that's exactly how it works so um and right place right time sometimes you do miss mm-hmm. something and I get people then tweet at me if I'm two three minutes late and they're like where have you been it's like I was sure. outside I'm sorry like sure. <laughs> how dare you how dare you walk away from your phone for more than a second <laughs> yeah <laughs> first of all if you if you don't follow Chris on Twitter what are you doing because Chris I I, I you are the man for the news straight away because I think a lot of people use Twitter you know, we use it for a conversation, obviously use it as a big part of your work now, but also it is, you know, a news source. I don't really follow news websites now. I feel like I'll get everything from Twitter. I'll see things that, you know, if, if, if it's important enough for me to know about, then Twitter is the place for it. Like how big a part of your job is being on Twitter now, would you say? Um, yeah, pretty big. Um, <laughs> sometimes sadly, but yeah, I'm the same. I always use it as a news feed. I, mm. The amount of times like friends and family initially, like a couple of years ago, and I'd be on Twitter a fair bit or tweeting a lot and they'd be saying, like, yeah, I just don't understand Twitter. Like who cares about what you had for dinner and things like this? I'm like, that's not what I'm tweeting. Um, I was like, and, and even if I'm not the one doing the tweeting. Doing yeah, I know. Yeah, I might, I might say what, what's on tonight. Good stuff. Breaking eggs all over um, the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> oh, you've seen me cook. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I uh, I kind of found myself kind of just using it as a newsfeed all the time, and, and not just for F1 reasons, but, you know, for mm. um, all sport, because, you know, I'm, I'm a big football fan. I'm a, I'm a fan of all sports, but, um, yeah, uh, it's it's quite sad, to be honest, how much sport I will watch. Uh, but, yeah, I, I stay in touch with it through Twitter, especially traveling and working away. Uh, mm-hmm. If I'm out and about in a paddock or something, like the amount of times I follow, so my football team is Yeovil Town, who are never on the telly, uh, yes. who are non-league. They're not particularly good. But, you know, the only the reason Twitter. I see Yeovil on my Twitter is because of you. Because <laughs> you yeah, exactly. tweet or like post. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one or two times that we score a goal. Yeah, uh, that's, that's about it. But um, it's just it's an easy way to stay, stay on top of things. So, yeah, that's that's why I use it. And then I figure that's the same for other people. Um, and, you know, people second, third screen, don't they, during a race and stuff like that. Mm. They want to know either your opinion on something or if, you you hear something on commentary that they missed or you hear team radio that they missed or you know maybe they've not got their sound on because they're listening to something else but they've got the, the the pictures all those sorts of things you know people use it as kind of like a second or third screen as well so uh that's that's the bit that always winds up other like some of my friends that are journalists they get really annoyed with me like live tweeting during a race or something because it's flooding their feed and they're like come on but um yeah people seem to engage with it and want it so uh, if it was me and i wasn't able to watch i'd be following on twitter as well yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, well, because it is behind a paywall for a lot of people as well. So I think f- for, for many, especially in the UK, like it is the only real kind of way of accessing the race in live. And, and I think, you know, I, I, obviously I hope that changes. Um, I hope I know in plenty of countries like when I, it was it was funny, actually, I um, when I went to Ibiza last year with my missus, we managed to get or she, bless her hand. And she pulled she pulled it out of the bag. I can't remember w- which race it was. But she managed to get like a free trial subscription with the zone. You're not you're not getting that in the UK with Scott with Sky Sports, as far as I'm aware, anyway. And we could watch the race no. and it was amazing. But Chris, yeah. I wanted to talk about, you know, known for F1 now. This has been your work for a while, but how much of your working career has been spent covering F1 specifically? Or were you, you know, working in journalism? covering different sport or some, covering something different has has all your adult life been um working life been covering f1 pretty much yeah if we did it as a percentage it would be like 98 percent. i uh, i graduated uni in the summer of 2010 mm. and um I, it was weird someone asked me about this the other day and, and i can actually say now so it's been a decade of doing f1 it was 2011 it was january 2011 i got the job at espn mm-hmm. f1 on their uh, formula one website in london and um i was uh, assistant editor I think it was uh, anyway I was basically there was two of us um, mm. like my boss was a guy called Lawrence Edmondson who's still there and, and really really good at his job uh, so he wasn't going anywhere which is why I had to eventually move but um, <laughs> yeah I uh, I joined them and all I'd done since I'd left uni was I'd already worked in F1 a bit I'm, I'd sort of blagged my way into the British Grand Prix in 2008 um, on the media services team I contacted the um, uh, what was this? It was, he was the national press officer, uh, a guy called John Horton, who um, sadly died a few years ago. And he was um, just, he was, he did the British Grand Prix and the British Rally and mm. ran, ran the media center for both. So I contacted him and said, look, I'd love to come and shadow you and see what you have to deal with because I want to be, a, I was doing sports journalism at uni. So I, mm-hmm. I want to be an F1 journalist. I want to know kind of what your limitations are or what you have to deal with. So that if, if I get to that stage that I'm a journalist, I know, kind of how to deal with you and and mm-hmm. and like what what the working environment's like and i remember his email reply being like what do you mean well, i think he phoned me but it was like what do you mean by shadowing you can't follow me around like a dog you can come and work for me if you want um so <laughs> for, for free i was i was allowed to come do a week at the british gp and and i remember first day i got there i had a little Citroen saxo uh and oh, none what? The... yes mate i yeah. can picture it now <laughs> a, a, mis- a mischief that had uh, a red decal uh, in the rear view that I didn't put there, the previous owner put there. They also of had a course, drain. of course, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> sure, mate. <laughs> they, had a proper, they had a proper drain pipe exhaust on it as well, stainless steel one that I, um, nice. I did remove because it was too loud. But um, it also had pro- uh, personalized number plates. So it said Jessica's Saxo on it. And I never changed that because when I was at school, I was like, if, if I ever annoy anybody, then they won't know it's my car so um i left them on and um yeah my, my better half Big jess brain. always thinks that's hilarious that my first car I was, was gonna say. After her. um <laughs> yeah so i so i pulled into the paddock and they had done the gates up and reversed into what had been a parking space you could see there'd been one there and it was at yeah. one end of the paddock and they'd kind of like painted them out in black uh went inside and introduced myself to john and said look i'm here to help um you know what you need and he and he said you know i'll oh, where have you parked i was like i oh, just downstairs he's like 
downstairs and he looked out the window and I actually reversed up to the door of Bernie's motorhome. So I'd actually technically blocked in Bernie if he was, if he'd been in, he wouldn't have been able to get out, but it was so early. It was Monday before the race. So he wasn't there. Um, and they had me clearing out lockers and stuff for the photographers, which was basically meaning emptying the stuff they'd left in a year before, which was nice. Um, so I did all that sort of dirty work and, and, and did three years of that. So I kind of had F1 experience. So I did six, I did the half a season in 2009, the first year the BBC had it, uh, doing TV logging from Television Centre in London, which was basically just saying whatever was on screen, you kind of put it into a program that says, uh, so if someone wanted to search for a certain shot, if they wanted a, you know, a wide shot of Lewis walking through the paddock, um, I'd have sort of made a note when that shot was on screen, so it's easy to find. Um, so I was doing that for the the second half of the season, I think it was. Um, so I'd, I'd had work in F1, but yeah, left uni in 2010, and uh, did an internship at Bauer Media, which is the polite way of saying that I did uh, an internship on, on FHM, which was uh, quite fun. Um, and I mainly did sports there. But again, yeah, so I stayed kind of in media and journalism, uh, just looking for the right opportunity. And then, yeah, I'd only been out of uni six months and ESPN needed a, a kind of junior editor guy and and mm. I managed to get the job. So straight into it, um, straight pretty much straight out of uni and, and never left. How do you think that's kind of, because... You know, you say you're a fan of a lot of different sports, but your whole adult life, pretty much you've been working in F1. So do you still feel like you can really enjoy the sport because your work is so immediately tied to it? And, and you know, for me, for example, like this F1, F1's only become my job in the last kind of year. And, and I've spent, you know, my first 27 years of life enjoying it as a hobby, as, as my escape. Whereas, whereas for you, that's been such a fundamental part of your, your working life. Do you, do you still feel you get that kind of, yeah, you know, what's the kind of balance? It's, I've got to be careful how I answer this because if, if I'm blunt, no. Uh, but it's not that I don't love my job. And I do, like, I still love, like, you still get the buzz before the lights go out. You still love watching racing, but you are not enjoying it the way you used to as a fan. Um, mm. And your, your adrenaline's for different reasons and you're exhausted at the end of it. Like, you know, your race day goes from what used to be, I couldn't wait for the show to start an hour before a race. And I was, yeah. you know, my whole Sunday was just spent waiting for the TV yeah, yeah. show to start. And then as soon as it was finished, I was like, when's the next one? It's so long away. Now a race day is a, you know, 14, 15 hour day where by the time it finishes, you're exhausted. Um, and it basically the way I look at it, like, so I still have huge enjoyment from every other sport. And to me, sports escapism, it's kind of, yeah. you know, it's, it's inspirational. Some of the stuff that happens in it, it's massively dramatic because it's unscripted or, it, you know, should be unscripted. And the yeah, fact that, that. <laughs> yeah, I thought we might. <laughs> um, and, and the fact that all of that still exists means I get that escape from other sports. Uh, but it, it does mean that I, I don't get it from F1 anymore because, yeah, you are in work mode all the time. Uh, and I still absolutely love it. I, you know, it's, it's a dream job and I wouldn't change it for the world. But uh, it does mean, yeah, it does change your kind of attitude towards it or the, or the kind of the, the way you get your enjoyment out of it, I guess is the best way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. Well, because when you were, when you came out of university, was, was F1 the, when you list all the sports that you're into, and obviously you've done sports journalism, so you could have, I guess, gone into any, any of those sports. Was F1 top of your list or was it that you saw the opportunity and you just took it and you kind of fell into it that way? It's actually quite funny. This is one of those things where if there was a mo like when you define little moments in your life where you didn't realize at the time what a big deal it was. But yep. on the first day of uni, um, we ha we'd had like a lecture and stuff. And then we had a seminar and there was about 30 people on my course. And we had to sit around, we sat around this room where there's computers all the way around the outside. So mm. everyone's kind of like facing away from each other. And the uh, course leader, um, as it was, I think it was course leader, one of the one of the um, lecturers anyway, sat at the front of the room and he got everyone to turn around and said, right, you know, one of the early things we want to know is what sport you want to cover go and he just pointed to the first person like in the row so you've got 30 people in a big u shape they're mm. all going to list their sport and i was about somewhere in the middle and it genuinely went football 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 everybody was football uh ah. this is a i was i went to uni in preston so northwest so it was a big football okay. area but also um rugby league was big there's a couple of union sides up there and i think one other guy so there was there were four girls five girls on the course mainly male one other guy said rugby, everybody else said football without fail. Um, and I was either football or Formula One, but I was absolutely going to say football if I'd have been first, because to me, a lot easier mm. to work in. You could be the local correspondent, you know, I could be the Oval Town reporter or whatever and stay in Somerset and, and or, or could have, you know, become the, the local reporter for 
any professional team in the UK, basically. There's 92 of those um, or even more. And I just felt there was a bigger scope or, you know, maybe then you could cover it abroad or something. And it's just such a huge sport. Formula One is 10 teams, one championship, 20 odd races a year. So, so elite level to me Mm -hmm. to try and reach. You know, it wasn't like you could do Formula One by doing only Formula Three or something like that. You know, a lot of people love their junior formula racing and, and can cover that or they use that as a stepping stone but mm-hmm. it, it was just such a small kind of window to cover f1 it just looked unrealistic to me but mm-hmm. as they went around the room i was like there's no way i'm saying football if everyone else is so i was that i was that guy who was like well i'm gonna stand out uh, and i said <laughs> i said formula one and it turned out my course leader was best mates with jonathan ledyard who was bbc commentator at the time wow um so nice. so he put me in touch with him but i actually got to know him through doing bbc work anyway mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, from there it's funny, but yeah, just people that know people in the sport, then just slowly pass your details on a bit. They're like, oh, I've got the student or whatever. And I guess within football, the course leader would have to go, well, I've got these 28 students who will want to cover football. You know, you can't yeah. give that to somebody, you know, but you can give, oh, I've got this one guy who wants to F1. So yeah, it just opened a few more doors and it meant they encouraged me. I had to cover formula one with everything I could do on the course. Um, yeah. and I created a TV package on how hard it is to break into F1 where I interviewed John Booth used to run uh, Virgin, um, uh, Adam Parr when he was at Williams, uh, trying to think if I've got anyone else, but I got BBC gave me some footage I could use because it wasn't getting broadcast anywhere. So they let me have that. And it meant I could create a TV package on F1 that again, just, it made it stand out towards everyone else because everyone else was just doing football. So, mm. um, that really turned out to be just, just that answer completely mm. changed the direction of the whole course. And from there, it meant I had a bunch of contacts that were quite good for me when I left uni. So it really helped open that up if i'd have been told when i left uni you know now going to football i would have found it a lot harder i did a bit yeah, of reporting yeah. for goal.com uh, when it was more kind of like almost um fan-led and uh I, I remember doing like sunday premier league reports for them and the odd bit of news writing but that seemed like it just seems so complex trying to work out where you're going to fit in in that sport with f1 it seemed actually a lot clearer so it kind of helped yeah. me yeah because i mean to have to have such a majority of people I, I can i can picture the scene like and growing up for me like everyone was football it was all mm. football where I, where, where I grew up and you know that saturation probably would have made it more difficult to kind of stand out i guess football is such a global sport f1 is but it's it's so different isn't it again you can cover like you said you can cover lower league you can cover, cover national league and cover like there's kind of equivalence in, in, in motor racing, I guess, but was, was F1 always the, you know, when we talk about you're into F1 specifically F1 or was it, you know, did you dabble in other motorsports or was it always like the formulas that you were like, because obviously that's the, you know, F1 is the motorsport that the only motorsport that's really broken the public consciousness and is known by everyone, even though not everyone follows it. Everyone knows what F1 is, right? Yeah. Um, although it's funny, if I say to someone, I'm an F1 journalist and they, and they don't know motorsport, they have no idea what I'm saying. You know, they, they figure it might be financial or whatever. Cause if you just <laughs> really you have to, yeah, you basically have to say formula one racing oh, um, okay, or, right. or yeah, motorsport yeah. journalist. If you say just F1, they think it's like a niche term for, you know, something weird and complex that they don't know. Oh, so, um, that enough. always surprised me. I think yeah. weirdly more recently it's, it happens less, but, um, yeah, for quite a while they'd be like F1, what's that? Mm. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very much F1. It was, I think it was, that was what really got me hooked on racing and then kind of working backwards. Then anytime I could go and watch some racing, I was hooked on it. I could watch, I could watch any type of racing, especially live, like on site, because I was just mesmerized by even just watching gaps between cars. Every time they came around, it'd be like, right, who's getting closer? Who's getting further away? Mm. Because if, if you saw, yeah, two cars getting closer, even slowly, the anticipation built that at some point they're going to be fighting each other or whatever. Um, and yeah, so I started doing, I remember I went to Alton Park to cover Formula Ford for the uni racing team that they had. So the motorsport engineering degree. So there was a, they would run a car for a kind of a professional driver, a guy that could pay for the nice. seat who was very good. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to remember his full name. John was his first name. Um, I want to say it's John Hawkins. That could be, I've just could have just created a person out of nowhere, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> this was this, this Blackburn based uh, racing driver who was really good. And um, yeah, he, uh, he would come and run the car and, and the uh, students would, uh, put it together and, and kind yeah. of engineer it so uh, I went and reported on it for a few times and just got to know all those guys and even that was great fun I mean mm. it's was, it was a bit annoying that it was used on your weekends and at uni like no one else was doing anything on the weekend but um, you'd go you'd go away and um, go to a racetrack and see a load of other 
cars going quickly it was really cool so mm. um yeah i was always like excited by racing always would watch as much as i could indy car I'd, I'd watch all the time um but i never really thought about working in any of the others at that point i think it seemed a bit too much of just reaching f1 seemed like a pipe dream as it was so yeah, yeah. to to then think oh maybe i'll get to cover x y or z uh never really crossed my mind until i actually properly got into it and a few opportunities mm. started to open up and then you're like well i'd love to do the indy 500 i'd love to do le mans and that sort of thing so uh you start trying to then you get a bucket list to try and tick off to yeah to, to keep reminding yourself i think also of how, just how cool it is what you're getting to do so if you're that close to it if you don't then go for those moments i mean it feels like it'd be a huge waste do you, do you remember the first time because obviously a, a nice kind of uh a bonus of covering a global or even like when you're talking about india or whatever is the traveling aspect which obviously you know isn't guaranteed in, in any sport because you could just cover it on a national basis but do you remember the first time you actually went away like got on a plane for work to write about motor racing yeah uh, it was pre-season testing 2012 uh, in barcelona uh, mm. and so I'd been told when I joined in 2011, but just before the first race, really, I, I think I followed testing from home, but my like start okay. date was March. Um, and I did the whole season where, um, I kind of learned the ropes and, you know, ESPN weren't sending many people to races at that point. It was still at the time when websites weren't really all that welcome in formula one. Mm. It was, you know, it was papers and magazines only. So, um, we were trying to kind of break through a little bit and, uh at the start of 2012 i think lawrence who i worked with had gone to a couple of races in 2011 or maybe one um so 2012 they were like right um lawrence is going to the first test you're going to the second um and yeah i remember i had to like try and book it on a budget and you know espn's a big company but i hadn't really thought like yeah you know, i was just like great i get to go and it's someone else's money so mm -hmm. i'm not going to waste any of it so i put this rubbish little hotel out on the outskirts of barcelona <laughs> but like in a in a crappy industrial estate yeah, that was yeah. like right by a sewage system almost nice. um that had the tightest car park you've ever seen uh it was just a rubbish cold single room yeah. and I, I didn't know that many people at that point knew a few but yeah I'd, I, I you know i had no kind of like network so i went and i just worked like flat out i wanted to a, prove myself and show that i could bring good value yeah. um but b i was like you know i, I didn't want them you know i thought if i'm thinking oh, i'm gonna go for dinner with this person or for drinks with that person and that got back to the boss they'd be like well you're not focused on the job but yeah. to me i didn't actually realize that that social side really existed so just being there was the cool thing to me and then you start hearing of other people going out for dinner together and stuff and one you feel a bit left out because obviously you don't know anyone yet <laughs> uh but two you're like oh yeah like actually when your job is done like you're in this incredible place you're gonna you are gonna get to see a bit of it or do a bit of it and it's very little actually um when mm. you work some of the days that we have to work you genuinely see hotel airport and like a, a place for dinner and that's about it um sometimes you don't even get that luxury it's you know grab room service or eat at the track and and go to bed um and you can't complain because you're still in a great place but um yeah I'm, i always remember that first one and the big lesson i took from it aside from I want to like know people so that actually socially I don't feel quite so alone. Yeah. Um, and that was quite a hard thing to do because you don't want to be fake and you know, you want to make proper friendships, which is actually really easy because everyone's got the same passion. Mm. But um, that first thought is, you, you know, you don't want to then pester people and go up to them and be like, hi, I'm Chris, like talk to me, be my friend. So uh, it took a little while, but I, I had some good people that I, I loosely knew already and they, they were very helpful. But yeah, I learned also not to skimp so much on the hotel because you end up exhausted anyway with the work you're doing and the last thing you need is to be like dreading going back to your hotel and not getting a good night's sleep and, and not having yeah. a hot shower and things like that so um yeah i started just like now i work for myself i i kind of don't mind paying probably over the odds for some of the hotels because genuinely like being rested is actually really important in this job so i kind of feel like that's investing in my own well-being slightly and if it means i make less profit so what it's, it, I'd, I'd rather have you know a solid six hours sleep with no fear than... properly, man. yeah, no, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, like toilet exploding in the night because <laughs> really. um, yeah. how much because i guess kind of talk me through you know when you talk about these really the really long days uh, are we talking about like race days qualifying like saturday sundays are we are they the days that are the you know 12 13 14 hours sometimes and you know talk me through kind of from morning to to when you finally close that laptop for the final time like how do those days typically kind of go what's the kind of chronological order of, of events 
Yeah, so, so my busiest day tends to be a Saturday now. It, it kind of depends because okay. I'm freelance and I have different clients. But there was, there was a, uh, the main spell before kind of COVID really tried to hurt things. Um, mm. I covered Formula 2 and Formula 3 in terms of hosting their press conferences for the FIA. So uh, I'd have to be there whenever they had qualifying, whenever they were racing. So um, it'd be early start in, into the track for, I don't know, 8-ish, 8.30 on a, on a Saturday morning because normally there'd be a, an F3 race at that time um the f2 race would tend to happen after qualifying uh so you get the f3 race uh, and then the press conference for that is so i'd have to you know make all my notes and, and host that press conference uh then you're into fp3 so you're, you're essentially just watching that in case anything happens mm. um writing some news uh for the website in terms of what people have said from friday or if there was anything you know breaking on saturday in terms of someone has an issue or an incident or just general news um because websites just want fresh content and if nothing appears until after qualifying that's you know three four in the afternoon sometimes um so then yeah that would be uh, fp3 time then you go into the gap that was normally the quieter spell used to be between fp3 and quali but then i started doing some tv work with uh, nbc in the middle east so from about an hour after uh, fp3 finishing when i'd write some little pr bits uh then you go into into the paddock um start doing like punditry stuff just there's a lot of waiting around at those bits and they'll come to you for five okay. minutes ask you some questions so you know what you think is going to happen certain things about the track certain things about the news of the weekend uh right up to about 10 minutes before qualifying starts then go to the tv pen stand in there for the whole session and interview the drivers as they as they get knocked out uh then as soon as that's done leg it back normally by the time you've gone through the whole top 10 and you get the top three who go and do a press conference and then come to you uh it's probably about half an hour 45 minutes after the session ended run back to the media center write up a report write up a bit more pr reaction um jump on like as now it is jump on all the zoom calls but it used to be in person run around the paddock go to all the media sessions write up the um, reaction pieces from the quotes you get from the drivers and the team bosses uh, then into the features so i'd write uh, two for the official f1 website one which was uh, kind of what to look out for in the race like five key topics you know driver acquisition uh, someone with a reliability issue whether it's a crucial run to turn one or whether there's good chance for overtaking so you know why certain strategies might work uh, and then a strategy guide as well uh, and for the strategy guide i interview mario isola each weekend so that's normally mm -hmm. about four hours after qualifying you do that so then you're only starting to write that feature what four four and a half hours after quali um so by the time you're done with it it's like five six hours after qualifying's finished and i think for a lot of people they think qualifying's over tv show ends an hour after qualifying everyone's done um, and we're working for a good five six hours after that so um yeah that normally takes you up to like 10 11 at night um uh, so you'll grab food at the circuit for for something like that uh, and it's not always that it's flat out all the time it's peaks and troughs definitely yeah of course um but yeah it's just the, the length of time it can be and obviously something unexpected happens you know someone crashed out in q1 that you've got to be ready to react yeah big time of course or something like uh suzuka 2019 when we had the typhoon so we cancelled saturday saturday was great um <laughs> saturday, was, saturday was a huge hangover and a bbc podcast so that was it didn't leave the hotel uh but sunday was you know really early into the track for quali and yeah. right with the reaction off the back of that i think we had a crash or two in that as well was it magnuson hit the wall and someone else kibitza maybe uh and then yes then, kibitza, yeah. then throw everything forward to the race do all your race reaction um and the main thing so sunday night the big thing for us is just speak to as many people as you can you're trying to mm -hmm. juggle sitting at your laptop and writing the reaction for people and and the report but also getting to the actual stars to the drivers to the team bosses because it's normally two weeks till the next race no access to them between then and now and mm -hmm you need to use that content over those coming what's normally about eight or nine days before the next media day. So um, the, the most important time is actually Sunday after the race to get content. And at the same time, it's when everyone wants to know stuff immediately. So it's, uh, yeah, that's quite a, quite a busy spell as well. How, how do you retain all this information? Because obviously you, you're, you're having to write about so much and all these topics. Like, do you have someone there to to help to to kind of listen in on these same conversations you're listening in on and then help or is it just is your brain just that big <laughs> it's, um, all in? <laughs> it's full of rubbish i can tell you that um <laughs> no it's it's more it, this is one where it helps with the traveling and being on site and stuff is you're so immersed in it like mm. so much stuff becomes kind of natural so it's things like you know i started out as as only written um media and doing stuff with espn and then slowly that grew into um, more broadcast stuff and i've actually done 
broadcast at uni and doing like the tv punditry when i do that or when i did netflix stuff and people are like don't you don't you get nervous aren't you worried about what you're going to say and you're like well no because it's actually the easiest part people are asking you things that you know it, you know it, yeah. it's your it's your life basically 24 7 and this is all stuff you know and if you don't know you say you don't know or you give an opinion mm-hmm. on it but um other than that you know it's it's a very easy thing to speak about it's not like an exam on a topic that you didn't know and you've revised for for two weeks you know it is something that you've done for years so it actually makes it quite simple in that sense and um it gets in a sense easier in that the longer you do it the more experience you've gained the more knowledge you've gained like we were just talking then when i'm trying to pull out who crashed at suzuka 2019 i mean it's kind of sad to some people that i can i think remember correctly the two drivers that did but it's because you were there and it just kind of sticks in your mind you didn't i didn't yeah you know, I didn't do anything specifically to retain that info. It just, you, mm. you know, you remember it because you were part of it. So that helps quite a lot. Um, and as, as a media center, there's, there's groups of people that do kind of stick together, help each other out. I hang okay. out a yeah, lot yeah. still with the ESPN guys. Cause I'm good mates with both of them used to work with them. Um, trying to think who else, um, even people like Luke Smith at Autosport who like, you know, you're all working for rival brands, but at the same time, there's certain times you can make each other's lives easier by, you know, if someone's transcribed Yeah, of something. course, because like, again, it, it's very different when someone's asking you for an opinion or you're reciting versus like when people are reliant on you to give correct information that you want to get that out promptly, but also you don't want to get it out so promptly that, you know, you've, well, I maybe not had time to like fully, fully fact check it so it's 100% correct or just, you know, making a mistake because you're going too quickly, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the amount of times I've done that sort of thing, or it was quite funny. I looked back through um, some of the features I wrote last year for Motorsport Magazine, and I'm pretty sure I ended up writing two that were completely like hypocritical, like completely <laughs> contradictory, where in one I was like, regulations need to be black and white because if you leave gray areas, people will argue in them uh, and you can't really have a common sense rule. And that was about um, when Vettel got disqualified in Hungary. And then yep. I noticed that later when it came to racing rules, I said you'd need a common sense rule because there's certain I think it was Kimmy got um uh added as like a you know exceeding track limits for getting driven off the track by uh someone at turn one in Austin. And oh, it was, Fernando, it, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it was it was Fernando. clear that he didn't go out there to gain an advantage and he yeah. shouldn't be. And the FIA did actually say that they they don't count that towards a potential penalty. But there's there's certain things where if you just take the rule as black and white. Like mm. it doesn't actually work when it comes to racing. So I, I, but then I looked, I noticed just the two headlines and, and remembered the two articles. I was like, actually, I've, I've completely contradicted myself there because you do so much and so quickly and you don't stop and go, you know, what did I write six weeks ago? You don't even think, what did I write two weeks ago sometimes? And it's quite easy to get into like a spiral of uh, what I'm doing now is the most important thing. And here's my yeah. opinion on it. And just, you don't step back all the time and go, hang on. So yeah, quite often across the media center, you're saying to each other like, oh, when did this happen? Or who said that? Or is this right? Um, and you kind of validate your own opinions off each other every now and then just to mm. make sure that you're not missing something or um, that, yeah, that you're not kind of rushing and, and making a bit of an error. So um, it is, it's quite good that that happens. Um, and then even the basic work, you know, transcribing, like the quotes have been said by a driver. We've mm. all heard them, how quickly we can get them out. Um, it shouldn't be a race about who can transcribe the quickest 20 minute press session like if five of you can do four minutes each and then you just listen through to it once to make sure it's accurate you've saved each other a load of time and it just yeah yeah at certain times it just makes sense to work together so uh that's quite that's quite nice and helpful for yeah when you're trying to do a million things at once yeah because i guess with this current day and age and, and i get it with with my videos my content when i where i'll say something and then like a few months later i'll say something else and people will be like no tobo i can reference this vid-. like because everything's everything's online now and everything's kind of it's almost like people will very very happy on twitter to hold you accountable for what you say and is that is that when did that change because obviously you know for as long as you've been you know since 2011 since you first started in the industry you know social media wasn't anywhere near what it is now like do you remember when that kind of transition to all of a sudden you've got this instant feedback from from everyone and and when you do kind of we're all gonna we're all gonna be hypocrites from time to time it's just human nature but like they'll they'll be on you for it like they'll let you know and like when when did that kind of transition for you happen personally uh, yeah, personally, it would have been uh, that first series of Netflix and being part of that, I think, because uh, it instantly grew some of my following anyway, but it mm-hmm. also kind of, it, for want of a, a better term, and this isn't quite right use of it, but it made you famous. 
and people mm. love to especially in the uk we love to tear down famous people and for to be fair nine out of ten people were a great i was always felt really lucky i had like great followers who never really criticized too much and were always you know would give me the benefit of the doubt if they're like you know if i if i yeah. said something and then one person was like that sounds like you mean this i'd be like no no sorry if that wasn't clear I meant this mm. and everyone else would be like no don't worry we knew what you meant which is rare these days isn't it that people mm. will take will take what you said and not take it literally but take take your uh, intention they'll, they'll apply their perception on your words rather than earnestly looking for what you actually meant by what you said absolutely and there's times where that's completely fair in the sense that if you leave it wide open and it's ambiguous like mm especially in a position of someone who's meant to give information, then um, that's a, a dangerous game to be playing. So you do have to be clear and concise. But there's other times you're like, come on, you know I didn't mean that. Um, but yeah, that that can come back to bite you. And some people just like to, you know, almost just get involved in a bit of a battle to try and prove themselves right. And I don't think it's that it's not anything personal. They're just, you know, they'll do it to anyone. They're just kind of like, hmm. well, I like to tell people where they're wrong. And I do yeah, remember yeah. when I was trying to prove myself and seeing other people maybe report something slightly wrong or um, if I wasn't very impressed with some of the quality of something that someone had done, I'd be thinking I can do a better job than that. It would kind of motivate me. I'd never called mm -hmm. them out on it. Um, I didn't think that was very professional or fair. And I also thought, yeah, that could be me in the future, which it turns out it has been. But um, yeah, it did, I could see where it comes from, where people get a bit um, fired up by it. But yeah, it was Netflix for me. So um, off the back of that, people then they either like really liked you and, and bought in and followed you and, and kind of liked what you offered them or they did, you know, didn't like you because they felt like they knew you personally and they didn't like what you'd said or something. And um, it was a small group, um, not specific people, but it just means there's in a small number that every now and then would just be like, you know, trying to pick holes in anything you said or did. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it definitely blew up this, the past 12 to 18 months with, with the rivalry between Max and Lewis, because that has been so intense on the track, but also, you know, both drivers have millions and millions of fans mm. and 99.9% .9 of them are brilliant and, and are great to each other as well. And then you just got the, the tiny margins where um, it's, you know, half the time as well, it's just people just being very vociferous in their support for one, but they quite often do it by attacking the other driver. Uh, and you know, that gets the backup of the other side and you know, it just becomes a bit of a running battle. But I mean, that's just sport in some you know in a large yeah. number of cases i mean there's lines crossed with um i mean you know there's some horrific racist abuse that that goes lewis's way and there's some um, just horrific language used towards max as well where you know uh, i think social media companies probably need to be hotter on stamping that out because if you do remove that i think it probably lowers um like the the pressure level when you've got mm. these interactions going on but um that automatically then you start getting caught up in that if you said something that someone thinks is uh bias against their driver or unfair then they they come pretty hard and i always remember the, the one that really got my back up i didn't realize at the time i found out from the dutch tv crew in uh saudi arabia who stood next to them for the tv pen and they're like oh it's chris medland who in um the netherlands uh is known as massively anti-max uh, and they found it hilarious because they you know i work next to them all the time and they they're great guys the guys at ziggo and um mm. like, i got really well with them and they were like we know you're like completely impartial but um, they just quite enjoyed the fact that I'd um, annoyed a load of Dutch fans um, because <laughs> not not that they wanted Dutch fans to be upset, but they just quite liked seeing me squirm, I think. But yeah. um, that came from Brazil. And it was as we were waiting for the um, kind of result of Lewis's uh, investigation to his rear wing after qualifying on the Friday. And it was dragging and dragging and dragging. And I'm like, this I is remember odd. this. Yeah, yeah and I wasn't actually in Brazil myself. I was I was at home, so I was just sat mm. at my laptop. This is another reason yeah. why I could tweet quickly. Uh, but I was just on WhatsApp messaging different people in the paddock, um, different team members and stuff, and just trying to get a feel for stuff. And basically got the steer that this this is what's going down, and and that the question's been asked that could Max have done something? Uh, at the very least, it's a defence you're going to use because mm. and like every team said they do the same. They're like you know, if you're if you've got something that's failed, and then just before it's been found to have failed and you de genuinely don't know the reasons why um there's a driver that's come very close to touching it you're at least going to ask could he have touched sure. it could he have damaged it For sure um they weren't you know Merck never said max did that but they yeah. were going to try and use that as their excuse to get out um just in in the kind of battle that they were in and i tweeted that out i said the longer this goes on the more i think what's happening is this because yep. it hadn't been officially announced yet and i've been told but you know off record from teams and stuff you kind of have to be careful how you say it but 
fans all asking what's going on. You're trying to say, actually, this is this is what's going on. And the abuse I got from Verstappen fans, basically, you know, threatening me and telling me that I was accusing Max of tampering with the car and what a horrific accusation that was. And that, um, you know, I, got, I had to be really careful what I said and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I remember seeing it and just being like, well, hang on. And I was, I think I was, I'd responded to a few, but I was just on the verge of being like, you know, how hard do I go? And the announcement came out that Max was then summoned. Mm. And I so nearly just tweeted in capital letters, told you. Um, but I, I did, <laughs> I did refrain at that point. I mean, I've given it away now, haven't I? Um, but yeah, I did like, and that was when I saw it. I was like, it doesn't matter if you're actually giving them more information for free as well. It's on Twitter. You know, I'm not getting mm. paid to tweet. Um, and I'm giving that for free as quickly as I can to fans to have as much understanding as possible. And to get that abuse back, I was like, okay, we're in, we're in that range now where it doesn't matter if you're doing a, what I think is a good thing or not by, you know, yeah. telling them everything you know, uh, people are still going to be angry at you for being the messenger. So yeah. um, I think that's just just the level we're at with, with two superstars going for the biggest trophy in our sport. You, you're going to have emotions that high. So sometimes you... You know, I try and think as well. Some people have had, you know, a terrible day. You don't know what's going on in exactly. their personal life. Yeah. Like they might be easily triggered uh, in the same way that I might be. And I might, I might take things the wrong way at the end of a long, tiring day mm. um, and snap or, or want to snap. And you just got to kind of remember that everyone's a human. And as much as it looks really abusive from their side, and I might take it that way, you know, the following morning, they might never have said that. And you just kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I, like, I think the thing I have found, you know, most challenging now with, because uh, again, and, and and I feel like this, what you've just said is a perfect example. You know, when you get like blind hate, it's just like, oh, whatever, like you, I, I feel sorry for those people. Cause you know, if you're in a position to do that, then you must be struggling with something in your personal life. And, and I genuinely feel that like empathy for those people. But the, the biggest difficulty, the thing I really struggle with is being misunderstood. So <laughs> in, in that instance, your, the, your like intent was to just put information out there. It wasn't to, to attach your own belief to it. It was just, but, but it was misunderstood as something else. And, and I'm the same, like, c come at me for things that I actually believe in. But when people say, oh, like, Tomo hates Sebastian Vettel, I'm like, but it's not true. I, I don't hate yeah. Sebastian. I've been critical of him, but it's not, like, if I did hate him, then I would, like, I, I could deal with that and bat it back but being misunderstood that is the thing that there was a podcast with uh true geordie podcast and i remember lawrence mckenna said it in it and he was like the biggest thing is that being misunderstood and i'm like that's so true because it's just you can't it's just it's just annoying because it's like that's not what i think this, this is not what i'm saying yet people are telling you that you are and it's when well, it's not the facts yeah i mean so i had it over christmas where criticized for putting out a tweet the week, uh, one week after the Grand Prix, where it was my first day off in about four weeks with the way we'd had mm. so many races and stuff. Uh, and I was sat watching Spurs Liverpool and Harry Kane put in uh, a tackle that VAR looked at and decided it was a yellow, not a red. And yep. everyone was like, mm, mm. probably should have been a red. And I was thinking the same. And, and I was like, oh. it just suddenly snapped me back to reality. I was like, I've been so engrossed in our stuff. I'm like, at least this happens in other sports too, that people aren't happy with officiating. <laughs> so I tweeted that basically. And the, uh, the comments on it, like quote tweeting it being like, you've done your best gaslighting and sweeping it under the carpet and all this. <laughs> and I was like, I did, Hey, I didn't see it coming, but B I was like, you know, I'd, I'd been on BBC news TV the day after the race, like what 4am on, on the like night of the race, I was on, um, ABC in Australia. And they said, you know, one, they called me biased towards Lewis because of my accent. And then when I, you know, disputed that they then um said i sounded deflated because of what had gone on i was like yeah you know this was this has been ruined by a, a, a stewarding decision and or you know um the the incorrect application of the rules and mm. it, it, it genuinely to me did not matter who won the championship or in a sense how they won it as long as it's between the two of them but yeah. for it to have been done the way it was done was completely wrong um and the whoever was about to win that race whether it was lewis or max you know in this case lewis absolutely was robbed by having those rules in, uh, applied the way they were but then i think a lot of people don't can't then see that it would be the exact same problem if it had been max leading and it had been mm -hmm. switched around because it, it had nothing to do with either driver or either team um so i i and i remember i'd you know i'd written comment pieces one i did on uh, the daily mail contact me or one of their outlets um mail plus and i did think about not writing for it but in the end i was like it's a big platform it's a good way of getting your opinion out and they just wanted my comments on it and I gave it and I basically said, like, um, Massey uh, influenced 
the race himself, like um, in in a way he shouldn't have. And you know, the, the intro said the the season ended the way it should have in the, in the sense it was a final lap shootout between two drivers who had been level on points going into it, perfect. But the way that came about, completely wrong, and went into basically uh, criticizing the FIA for it. And in half of these replies, people just took the screenshot of the intro and were like, "This is disgusting," and all this. And I'm like, "Read the piece." Like, you, that's like you said, the misunderstanding was huge, and and it really got my back up and really got me like I was so frustrated. Yeah. And you can't tweet quickly enough. You can't reply to them all. Um, and for some people, they were then seeing other people's tweets and responding, and you knew they didn't know the full context or the original story, so they were just almost bandwagoning and understandably because it's just what they were seeing. They weren't, you know, they hadn't gone to the original post or whatever. And it was really, it was the first time I'd had it. And I was properly like, oh, I'm not doing a very good job of handling this. Um, so mm. I did try and switch off. But then you had the Latifi uh, statement and yep. some of the messages he got were horrific. So I said, I thought, I, you know, I, I felt bad with what I got. Uh, I can't imagine what, how he felt getting death threats and things, mm. you know, it kind of put into perspective that maybe mine wasn't so bad. But I did say, you know, all of it came from people claiming they were Hamilton fans. Um, and I understood their anger and upset at what was going on and stuff. I just felt it was misplaced at me. And I even put in the feature, like, actually, I can write it off from them to me. It's they're so angry. They need an outlet to vent. And I'm getting the brunt yep. of it, but it's not about me. So I kind of can let them off for it. But I said, um, because of the messages that Latifi got, um, I said, I'm sure it's also Hamilton fans that, um, that have sent some of these. And people took it that I meant the exact same people that had tweeted me, therefore identifiable people, had sent death threats to Latifi. And it was never written that way. It never insinuated that. It definitely didn't mean that. But as soon as one person tweeted that and, and got angry, yeah. it ran away. And I, yeah, trying to defend yourself was impossible. And I, that was the biggest frustration I had because to be fair to them, once I calmed down a bit as well later on, I thought, look, their, their anger is well placed. You know, they're, they're right mm -hmm. to be upset about what happened. They're right to want answers. Um, they're maybe, you know, got to have a bit of perspective about the time of year it is. And just, you know, we can't be phoning people up 24 seven over Christmas and things and saying, what's happening now? What's happening now? What's happening now? Mm -hmm. If nothing is happening. But the, the once the misunderstanding stuff starts to get more and more out there and you're trying to defend yourself and it's impossible to, that, you're right, is by far the biggest frustration because, you know, then if, if you calm down and just take the time to properly explain, some people then go, oh, I'm really sorry. Didn't actually know that because they, they just kind of follow the crowd. Yeah. Uh, and that helps. Um, and it means you do have but, to keep engaging. But there's also, there's also a, a, not a majority, of course, but there's a significant portion who there is no amount of explaining. There's no amount of clarification. And, you know, it's one of them where they're the ones you really don't want to be getting into the kind of battles with because you're just wasting your time and you're giving them the oxygen that they that they're, they're craving quite clearly because it's not about having a nuanced debate it's about you know tribal this side that side i'm going to interpret everything you say in the worst possible way it's like something i just feel like it's like imagine if you everyone you knew in your personal life you gave them li that little benefit of the doubt and interpreted everything they said or did in the worst possible way like that's how a lot of and the anonymity i think of, of social media gives give some people this kind of almost like superpower to be able to like just go and and say things and and, and not think about you know the person who's actually behind and, and receiving these messages it doesn't matter how big or small your platform is like the, the english language all languages is a very you know subjective thing and people like there was one recently where i tweeted about how like i was super like, i was like good for lewis like not saying anything about what happened like I, I don't blame him i'd be fuming if i was him and like i think you know i i think he'll be coming back next season to prove a point and like that just the to prove a point it's like and people are like, oh, why does Lewis need to prove a point? I'm like, it's it's, it's just been fucked over, like, to, for his eighth world title, which, you know, he should have won that race. We all know this is true. As a human being, he's going to want to come back and be like, no, nah, like, I'm getting number eight. This is my, like, he's going to, because that's the competitor that Lewis is. Yet people choose to interpret that as, oh, you're saying Lewis needs to prove. It's like, that's not what I said. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's that interpretation part, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I had the same where uh, someone was like, oh, who did you want to win it? And I was like, nobody i wanted it to go to the final race which it did mm. i was like to yeah, me then that's I what i've been what saying all along as well mm. yeah but then with it when you had to kind of go right now what i said i what i thought would be the best this is just like wasn't even on record too much stuff but a few times i've said it since but um 
I, I thought if Lewis won an eighth in a row, or well, yeah, won, won that one, so so seven of them had been in a row, or so many of them had been in a row, um, and Max still didn't have one, too many people not really in tune with F1 would go, well, it's the car. How boring is it that Hamilton still yeah. wins? Like, whatever happens, Hamilton wins. You know, we all know the outcome. It used to happen with Vettel when he won his four, and there'd be some mm-hmm. epic races, but he'd win them. And people would come into the office and be like, who won? You'd be like, Vettel, but... And they'd be like, oh, boring. It's like, that one here, yeah, but yeah. it was a great race. Yeah. yeah. So trying to get that through. And I actually said, A, you yeah, know, Max is so talented. Like, he was obviously going to have a title at some stage. Probably not in this manner. Isn't the right way about... Uh, kind of coming together but it's you know he drove brilliantly all year and um is a world world class driver and i i said i think max getting his first and then lewis coming back and getting his eighth by beating max like Mm -hmm. in a new era you know responding to adversity again this is before the race it wasn't to that kind of adversity um i thought was was a better overall arc over those two years over this year and next season um and i thought lewis would actually get gain even more respect for that and yeah, you're right. Then, then some people still go, you know, how can you say Lewis doesn't have enough respect or, you know, how can you not respect Lewis enough yet? And I'm saying, I fully respect the guy. What frustrates me mm. is that not enough people do. And I'm thinking, how, how is the most obvious way of maybe that growing? So um, you're right. It's just, you know, some people want to take it the wrong way. And, and other times, you know, I've got to admit it's, you know, because we'll sit here and I, I know some people still then go, you're complaining about getting criticized on social media and and you're too sensitive towards things and sometimes absolutely i have found that you just misinterpret yourself and i don't respond to it but i think someone's had a go at me or i've actually left the door open for someone to misinterpret that was on me more as much as it was on them uh and you can't always expect someone to totally know what you were thinking or trying to say and you have to go okay i could have worded that better or sometimes admit you know twitter you're limited on characters wasn't the place to make that yeah literally you you want you want to convey a message and you're just like it's just that you get to that minus one on the on the the letter count i'm like fuck's sake but it's just like yeah you know youtube's just a platform right i i choose to to speak my opinion and, and talk on subjects and put that in the form of a youtube video but that's no different to someone putting out a a tweet thread of uh of their thought it's just a different means and obviously for you you kind of started with the the written journalism side of things but you said that broadcasting in uni was something that you dabbled in so was that always something that you because obviously going from just writing articles and taking information in to actually you know having a camera pointed in your face having your 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 voice being captured like that's quite a big step so was that always part of the plan for you and and do you remember the first time you were like right chris you're on camera today and were you were you like shitting yourself basically Uh, i was all right yeah i remember the first time was um pre-season testing 2018 Hmm. either 17 or 18 and it was when uh, sky used to still do the f1 report and um it, it, it was just they did like a special one at testing so crofty hosted it we sat on these rubbish plastic chairs in the middle of the paddock that they'd nicked from the little canteen around the corner um and it was me johnny noble from autosport and mm-hmm. and crofty and we just sat there chatting about what we'd seen so far um during testing and and basically how things weren't going well for red bull and Renault and that sort of stuff uh, and again no I, I didn't actually worry at all i'd seen it enough times and watched enough people do it and thought actually i could you know without trying to be arrogant at times thought i could do a better job yeah partly because by being a written journalist and, and the amount of stuff we cover, I actually find a lot of the guys that are, that you don't see, that you don't know, that you, whose names you probably don't know all that well, who are writing so much, um, are the ones that they cover everything. I mean, one of the best things I think Formula One has done, actually, is use Lawrence Barreto a lot more recently. Um, because Barreto used to work at Autosport, went to F1.com, and he would cover every team. He had contacts everywhere. He was so in tune with everything going on. When someone asked the opinion of, uh, of him, of what had happened at Aston Martin, for example... He knew he, he had some insight on it. Yeah. Whereas I find there's a lot of pundits who, because they're ex-drivers, for example, mm-hmm. they're they're brilliant at being able to explain certain things about you know racing incidents or what a driver's feeling or to give their experience mm-hmm. and recall things. But then they give an opinion on you know they they say a team's doing badly and that you know it's a real shame that uh, Alpha Tari having a poor weekend and they don't know why because they've not been down there to a media session because they don't yeah. need to it's not their job and they haven't had it told to them and we've always had that so I, I felt we actually had more immediate knowledge um and it's not always easy to convey so uh i i was actually quite confident that you know i I'd, I'd know something about everything they were going to talk about um uh, less 
you know, there's times where they ask your opinion and I was just probably a bit more wary of giving it firmly because I think, well, who am I to say what Red Bull should do? You know, I, I'm, I don't work for the team or, you know, I've never raced in Formula One myself. Like I'm just a guy who writes about it. But over time, you build up more confidence doing that sort of thing. Um, it was something I always wanted to do, but more originally I didn't. I was actually happy writing. I liked, yeah. I liked the, the way that that all worked and being in tune with so much. And then I actually notice one thing that I do feel is true. Like broadcasters do work very hard and they have some very long days, but there's also very much an on and off um, in terms of when you are on, are on air when, and doing things when you're not. And I, and then when you leave a race for many, that's it. Like they're, they're, they're doing far less, like they're so focused on the race content coverage, but you don't actually see that much stuff come out in between mm. that's bespoke. Um, whereas I probably work just as hard, if not harder. A lot of written people have to between events. Like this time of year is really difficult. You're trying to come up with our, with content, speak to people, get ideas, get features done uh, with little access to things. It's it's a it's really tough work. Um, and you always you know you're always on. The internet is always on. Whereas mm. a TV show isn't always on twenty four seven. It's on for yeah. its slot. So I actually suddenly thought actually that might be just be a little bit less stressful. Uh, might be a nicer kind of way to try and do things. But that's you know, the top of the top. People really respect people that are talking on TV. More people see what's on there. I mean, a lot of yeah. the um, unhappiness recently on social media has been at uh, Sky presenters and, and pundits not speaking out because people see them and respect them and, and yeah. value their opinion on TV each weekend. So if they're not seeing something from them now, they feel like they're letting them down. But, you know, it's our jobs to always be writing and talking about things. So like we don't get that kind of on and off switch as much. Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought moving into broadcast would actually help on that sense. Uh, and then the, I hadn't, I'd just done quite a few appearances on things like sky shows, uh, started doing a bit of presenting through the FIA formula three and formula two work. So I launched the F2 and F3 new generations of cars on yeah. like their Facebook channel. Uh, that was live kind of, it looked like live TV. It was just only going out on Facebook normally. Uh, and I think on YouTube for the F3 car, um, it was quite a while ago now. And then, um, and then Netflix was just, they wanted someone younger, uh, someone who was kind of always tuned into lots of different, you know, covered a lot of stuff. They didn't, they didn't need another broadcaster. They'd had, you know, they, they had the drivers, they had other broadcasters, maybe would have seen it as a conflict of interest maybe, but they wanted, um, I think they, they kind of want to tap into more unknown names yeah. who, who would just do what they needed uh, in, in terms of explaining the sport. And that probably opened the most doors. So it was actually off the back of that, then uh, NBC in the Middle East, so M for Middle East Broadcasting mm -hmm. Corporation, uh, they took over the rights at the very start of 2019, uh, at the last second, like a few days before Australia. And I was already out right, there. Okay. Uh, I knew someone who commentated for them. And he said that they need someone to show them around the paddock, help them out. Um, you know, it's all last minute. It's, it's going to be a mess. Can you help out? <laughs> Uh, and I was like, yep, yeah, sure. So I was just doing them a favor. And then yeah. they said, oh, we could, you know, do with someone pun basically as a pundit helping out, um, you know, explaining things. And they'd see me on Netflix and they were like, to them, I was this big yeah, name yeah. in Formula One. Mm. So, um, that kind of opened that door and yeah, that it was actually going quite well. I had quite a few different things lined up for 2020 in terms of different broadcasters. And it really felt like there was momentum behind it, which would have been nice. I didn't want to move away from written stuff. I love the writing stuff I do. I just probably would have had less writing that i would have done but i write for a racer in the us that i they've been brilliant and they really helped me go freelance and kind of create i guess my own path in in the sport mm -hmm. which has been amazing so i really want to make sure i keep writing for them and in my mind i was starting to put that all together and then COVID hit and all the tv channels weren't traveling anymore you know uh, as print media so my pass is through the fia which means we're not allowed in the paddock for the first year of covid um because the way the rules were only broadcasters could go in and i wasn't yeah. on a broadcaster's pass all that sort of thing um so yeah it it, it it will stop there um and kind of has pushed it back a long way but you know we'll see how, we'll see what the future brings on that on that front yeah because i mean with with the rona and how that's changed things like how close would you say from a from the background from from the broadcasting point of view how what percent would you say we are back to normal because obviously there's still the masks there's still there's still things that are different but also what things do you think will have changed now for good 
regardless once we've fully seen the back of this there will be i'm sure there's going to be things that have changed maybe for the better um but also yeah just things that maybe have been discovered because again like what the working from home phenomenon like a lot of people now aren't gonna aren't going to be prepared to go back to an office five days a week like i think that's going to change forever for a lot of people but yeah within formula one what is kind of those permanent stains of the virus that you think will, will be present but not necessarily bad things just things that will exist now forever really in the sport uh so i i definitely think remote um press conferences which is something that they started doing like they want they didn't want uh print media going to races originally because in their mind you didn't need to be there like you know a tv crew had to be there if, if you know you could tell if they are or they're not and they were like with print you don't really get that you can see it on tv gave us access to like f1 uh, tv portals and things and did press conferences via zoom mm. and that was a lot more easily controlled uh, and also meant that they could allow people who weren't on site normally as well access if they need it so now yeah. i think they want to if they want to maximize the reach they'll go okay we're going to keep everything on on um video call for like official press conferences because that way we can have a bigger audience or we can uh accommodate more people and we can limit the travel um yeah. Or, or they'll do like you know a hybrid type thing so i can see that uh being one um that the, to be fair we're, we're probably 98 percent of the way back to normal now um there's the, the testing schedule is is huge and you're right yeah masks the bit that doesn't make sense to me is masks outside uh, i get it indoors but um mm. i feel like we're the only sport left that's wearing masks outside and you know a lot of f1 is outside so it just seems a bit strange but then it's they've slowly you know if you've got money it seems to make a difference because they've slowly limited it where if you're a broadcaster and you've stood static um or you're you know you've got a two meter distance between you and someone you can have your mask off but you can't do that if you're a print journalist in the exact same situation because you don't pay millions to cover the sport. So, um, yeah, those sorts of moments you're like, well, hmm. okay, this is these aren't these are strange things that are just kind of not quite seem to be based on health and yeah. science. But um, um, I, I don't know if you can tell, but the dog doesn't agree with it either. Um, <laughs> print <laughs> journalists are just you're just more <laughs> disease ridden, clearly. Yeah, pretty much. It's how, it's how they made us feel actually when it started in 2020. First race back, I was I was lucky enough that I was one of those that was allowed to go. I was kind of yeah. asked if I'd be up for going if they allowed some media to go, and I said yes. But you had to commit to such strict protocols, all to sit in the media center and not be allowed to leave. You couldn't go anywhere else at the racetrack apart from just going to get tested. So you couldn't go to the paddock, you couldn't go and talk to anyone in person, you weren't allowed to meet up with them away from the track. Mm. You just You were locked away as if you had it, whereas everyone else carried on a little bit more mixing. It was still you know, much more limited than it had mm. been, but it genuinely was like they were treating, well, print media have it. Uh, and we were actually the bubble that had it the least. I think there was one case in the whole of the 2020 season from the print yeah. media, and photographers weren't included in that. There's one photographer that got it, that was it. Um, whereas teams broadcasters everyone else had little outbreaks and things so um that was quite funny but yeah they they kind of did try and keep us at an arm's length for a bit and i think um it, it would have changed the way that print media get to cover things we're still um in a situation where we're getting access back and the teams were very good at, at promoting this so letting us we you know uh, media are now all in the paddock they can go and have those chats that you know this is where you find out key information yeah um that quite often is you know, if someone wants to, you know, if a team member wants to tell you something that is um, related to another team or to something within their own team or, you know, the FIA or Formula One itself, whatever it may be, and, you know, that it's kind of like, you know, quite sensitive or quite damaging, mm. you know, they don't want to write that down in a WhatsApp message because you've you've got a, you know, a Don't black see. and white record of it that mm. who knows what might happen to it. I mean, they trust yeah. you, but you, you just still have that there. Yeah. Whereas if they tell you in person, it gives you, you know, something to go and chase, something to work with. But in a sense, they've got safety net. If, if they really, really yeah. wanted to or needed to at any time, they could turn around and go like, oh, I don't remember saying that. What are you talking about? So, yeah, exactly. said that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I've never had that happen. But yeah, exactly. It, it could. I could see that. I could see mm. the need for or the desire to have that kind of safety net. So people are much more open when you can speak to them in person. Um, and a lot of this is built on relationships and trust. So you need to yeah. actually see people for it. So that's that's opened up. Um and I, I do feel that it's probably going to be the fact that um, they just try and and do like connect the work from home bit as much as they can, so that more people remotely can be involved. Mm -hmm. I think they'll do like virtual paddock club stuff. You know, drivers will do more virtual sessions, so they connect with fans who aren't there or with people that will pay money to speak to them who aren't there on site um, because it's another revenue stream. 
that of course. sort of thing. I, Absolutely. I think, I think that's what's likely here to stay. Most other things yeah. have kind of gone pretty much back to normal that I can think of. I'm trying to remember, trying to work out if I've forgotten anything obvious, but um, yeah, aside from like, even just the way we were all interacting by the final few races, Austin was the one last year when it suddenly felt normal again, that the paddock was completely right, open okay. as it had been. We were allowed in motomes again. Uh, you know, VIPs were in the paddock and it all felt normal. And once those started to go by without major problems and health issues, mm. then then it gave confidence that they could keep doing that. And I think now they're seeing that the post-COVID world can be pretty similar to the pre-COVID world, where I, I don't think that was certainly a year ago, but now it seems to be. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think the the desire for, like you say, about kind of the the fan connection through like Zoom calls and all that, you know, I feel like that is also, there's more demand for that because of drive to survive i think i think that's a that really gave us a you know not just us as as seasoned f1 fans but also you know bringing new people in because you're telling the stories of these you know this is this is always the the thing i compare to football you know with football you know you're yeovil and west ham we follow these teams and and the the players come and go but there'll always be that connection to this this entity this it's not a human entity it's not even a you know we just move bloody stadium and you know it's still west ham united and it's like but we, we've we've Formula One, that the connection typically, apart from really Ferrari, I'd say, is that is the connection to these individuals, these human beings, and obviously giving that connection, that kind of insight. You know, when when you were called up to feature on this Drive to Survive thing the first time, you know, what did you think when you were first approached? Did did you anticipate it would? reach the heights and do as much as i mean we've seen you were there at austin there's the size of the crowds compared to when we last went there in in, in 2019 like you know did did you foresee that it would be as big of a deal as it has been no not at all um it was quite funny actually at first it was quite awkward i got introduced um it was james allen that kind of introduced me to um mm. the, the production crew and said that i'd be someone they could um use and they wanted to they didn't want talking heads too much originally. So the way they wanted to do it was um, myself, Rosanna Tennant, who now works for Formula One, uh, and Michael Schmidt, a German uh, journalist for Automotor and Sport, who doesn't have social media, isn't a big name um, outside of the paddock, basically, but very well respected within it. They wanted the three of us to kind of sit and chat um, just in certain locations. We did it in, in Melbourne in the press conference room just to talk about things that have been going on over the weekend to kind of give it context. But they genuinely were like, just talk about, you know, um, how quick Mercedes look and, you know, um, where Ferrari are. And they weren't, that was it. It was just, you know, prompt go and they'd record it all. And it's just not how it happens <laughs> like in real life. Um, and I think one, it probably came across as that. And two, it made it hard for us because you're trying to talk about things. I remember talking to Michael for the next one in China. They did the same sort of thing. We had to meet in the paddock um, and start chatting. And he started talking about what the tires were going to do in the race, which was absolutely right. The sort of thing he needed to be talking about to like when I was saying about what might happen. But I knew that for Netflix, it wasn't what they wanted at all. Mm. Um, and you could see it wasn't really going to work that way. And soon after, they're like, look, we can we just get you into the studio to do a bit of recording? We've got, they then worked out basically where they had gaps that needed filling in and they needed someone to explain certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was doing that. And, you know, A, my role was very basic. I was saying that, you know, on Friday we do practice and Saturday's qualifying and that sort of thing. Uh, and then you're just answering their questions that quite, quite often seem quite basic or obvious, mm. but is to make sure that everyone can understand. But you don't think then that you're creating something great and not me as in that they are creating something amazing. You're thinking this is quite basic. Yeah. And then the end product was brilliant because the access was just so, so much more than any TV company had managed to get itself before or that we would get as um, media. And for those that did buy into it, like, I mean, Ricardo was one of the, the first to do so. Um, but those who did fully commit and show themselves, but, mm -hmm. you know, their lifestyle as well away from the racetrack, they were people that fans could connect to. And for out of nowhere, yeah, it just it was huge. And completely, yeah, completely unexpected, quite cringeworthy at first watching myself talk because <laughs> you forget even half the questions you've been asked and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, like that's just a silly basic thing you're saying. But you, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of, oh, it was explained to me at one stage by the producers that they were trying to hit the audience of um, like a, a surfer in California. They work for themselves, like they, they, they've got a startup, they work online, so they work from home. 
and they're on their own schedule. So they get up in the morning, they go for a surf like eight, nine in the morning, come back, stick some coffee on, um, get a shower and they sit down and they've checked their emails and they're like, right, nothing urgent to do. Just going to flick on half an hour of Netflix, like what's on. That's the person they were hoping would flick the show on and they'd need to get their attention. So I had that in mind. Um, but again, when you hear that, you think, ah, that doesn't make sense. Um, and I think the whole point there was, it wasn't actually about hitting that person. It's that if you can hit that person, you're going to hit everyone. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it, and it worked. So yeah, I just, I remember doing, because I worked right for racer us Grand Prix 2018, it would have been, uh, I did, uh, some like VIP box appearances where myself and Jenny Gow went in and answered questions from, um, people that were on um like very expensive tickets essentially and um that had um good suites that they were sitting in to watch the race so not that many people asked that many questions they didn't need to it was just you know as an additional thing they had was well if you want to know more want to ask experts something they're here Uh, and we did a bit and jenny had much more interest than i got because she was the bbc5 live pit lane reporter um better known and it was kind of fine but i remember thinking i was like okay like yeah, didn't didn't mind doing it, but it was just a bit like um, it was amazing how few people actually really were that bothered. Like they were just mm. there to have a good time; they didn't care about too much about what was going on. A year later, did it. So this was the the first one after the first season had come out, and it was crazy. There was so many more people engaged, asking questions. So many more people excited to talk to me, wanting photos, autographs, things like that. Um, and you just went because, and you forget. It's basically yeah. If you if you're on TV, and you yeah. are um, seen by a lot of people, they yeah you know, they don't know you from before. So you are someone that they think is, I don't know, interesting. Uh, yeah. And then they found out very quickly by talking to me that I'm not. But the um, yeah that that step change was huge. And that was when I actually did realise I was like, whoa, this thing is massive. Yeah. Um, but my role wasn't really needed in the second one because I'd done a lot of explaining. And they had started to ask more leading questions, which they needed because they needed to make sure that, you know, they didn't want to play anything down. If they had anything they wanted to talk up, they then in their mind had like a line that they wanted saying or whatever. And sometimes they'd ask me to say something and I'd be like, well, I wouldn't say that. So we'd skim over it. And I think I just got a bit too, um, I just don't think I did enough for them after that. I think they needed someone who would just answer, who who would give basically record the lines they needed to fill in the gaps. And sometimes yeah. I just didn't think they were right. So, you know, I still got to face up to these people in the paddock and work with them. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't say that Carlos Sainz hates Lando Norris when I know he doesn't um, <laughs> like that sort of thing. But, you know, some, some of the lines were things like that or stuff about VJ Malia that I just didn't know. And I was like, I mean, you could say that. You can't endorse I'm that. Not... Yeah. Cause it's coming from yeah, your mouth. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I think that's why it, it then drifted apart. But um, I, yeah, I think I've, honestly, I think they've done a brilliant job with it. And mm. there's a lot of, uh, abuse that seems to have headed Netflix's way because of what happened in Abu Dhabi, like it was done for Netflix. And I'm, you know, it's probably given them some great content, but there's absolutely no way it was done for them. And, no. <laughs> and, and new fans coming in, I think, who were hooked on the sport probably were just as disappointed as existing ones about, about the way things went down. So um, I, th- I think it's one where I just feel a bit sorry for them that they that they get that leveled at them where they have yeah. nothing to do with it. Yeah, if you've if you've got your kind of tinfoil hat on, it's easy to make those. You know, oh, they just happened to be there when Toto smashed his headphones, or they just happened to be with Hass when Grosjean had his crash. You know, it's like, mm, yeah, but also like, you know, they're there for for to do a job. They cover the, they yeah. cover the the sport in a way that you know. Because what what do you personally make of the? Because the biggest criticisms I hear of Drive to Survive is kind of misrepresenting um these relationships and uh, you know the lando carlos thing for example i don't know f- f- from my point of view looking at that specifically it's very much like obviously there's this picture that's painted of them as you know very oh ooh, ooh, best friends that's the words that which you know of course you can have a good relationship but you can also still be rivals and i think i don't know i feel like that, that it, it's kind of both that there's netflix possibly over heightened that perception if, you, if you're a new fan coming in you'll get a different view to maybe reality but also i think what we see as fans we only see what the teams choose to put out what the drivers choose to say like we don't see 99.9 even though you see kind of a small percent and you actually work you're there so so in terms of that because obviously 
there's there has been a lot of criticism around it but also for me i'm just like when i sit down and watch drive to survive for me it's expectation i'm not expecting this you know nailed on like super accurate portrayal of race by race of, of the series i'm expecting an entertainment piece where we get to see a bit more of the drivers behind the scenes and i really like it i re- i I've had very little problem with Drive to Survive, but I think part of that is because I go in with, they're the expectations I go in with. So when it does play, you know, Grosjean saying fuck just before the crash, which obviously didn't happen. Like I can see why they've put that there and I know it's not true to life, but also I don't really care because I'm not expecting it to be completely accurate in that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's, that expectation is definitely key to it. If you've got that, it works brilliantly. I do think sometimes it's just a bit, maybe it's unnecessary to add certain things like that. I mean, like him saying that isn't needed when everyone watching is saying it for him. <laughs> like mm. Everyone's thinking, fuck. Um, and th- that sort of thing I think is maybe unnecessary. Or some of the sound edits where they cut in wrong sounds at wrong times and things that that really do great when you know the sport and you're like, you know, yes. somebody somebody's shifting up like when they're breaking or whatever. And it's like... <laughs> just looks weird and because you also know that some of it then like it's just going to confuse people a little um but on the whole i think again they're, they're minor things to complain about and they are very in the broad scheme of it they're super minor i think personally yeah and and they quite often you know that's that comes with just trying to set something else up and it's mm. it's the core content and it's the additional insight and access that the whole point of it i think is to really get fans to connect with more than just your superstar drivers like it was essentially it was lewis and, you know, Max was coming through, Fernando was just leaving, um, Kimi wasn't really a part of it, but Lewis was the guy that outside of Formula One, just in general culture, people knew the name Lewis Hamilton, they knew what Formula One was, they didn't really know anything else, and they knew that it was boring because one person wins all the time, that's how they saw it. Mm. And when you can suddenly connect them with Pierre Gasly finishing fifth and what a great result that is, or, you know, um, George Russell putting a Williams in Q3, because they understand what a big result that is. And it doesn't matter just what's happening at the front, but that they are kind of um, invested in stuff further down. That is the win. And that's what they're really going for. And I think that's the bit that's that's worked best. So in a sense, yeah, it could be um, as factually inaccurate in terms of audio and, you know, certain things, the chronological order of stuff. That's fine. If it gets people to actually understand the drivers and appreciate them and appreciate the nuance of the sport more so that they watch and they keep watching which so far seems to be happening Mm. then it's then it's great for the sport in my view and um it's just in the same way that i guess any of us would you know when i said about pundits that say certain things they don't know everything or um or when i might write a feature that someone else will read and be like i totally disagree or i think that's rubbish like that sort of stuff happens you don't like you know netflix it doesn't need to just make everyone sit back and go excellent that's 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 exactly how it happened that's spot on and i can't yeah. find fault in it because also then no one will really talk about that either like you, you th- these things are it's still talking about our sport which can be controversial so the fact that it in itself like incites debate i think is it's fine as, as long as they yeah. never put words in someone's mouth the low the you know that probably mean anything uh then i think they're they're the right side of the line Exactly. Like like you were saying, you know, if, if if someone's telling you to say, you know, Carlos and Lando hate each other when that's clearly not true, that's very different to to using all uh, right, yeah, unnecessarily using audio clips just to to make clearer the message that you're already conveying. You're not changing yeah. the message, you're just, you know, amplifying it almost. But but obviously, you know, you've you've been working in the sport now for like you say, over a over a decade now. And inevitably you're you know you you've had these connections with you you're going to get to know drivers you're going to get to know teams and you're going to have you know you, you're only human as much as yeah you know, you, you're a journalist but you're also a fan you know you're gonna I'm, I'm not going to ask you to tell me who your favorite drivers are or whatever but what i'm saying is that how do you as a, and i think this is just a more general journalism question this would be the same for you know if you're a football fan but you're writing about football and yeovil were playing like how do you how do you as a journalist kind of check that? Because we all have those unconscious biases and, you know, I, I'm an Albon fan. So obviously I give Albon more benefit of the doubt than most people because I'm super invested in Alex and and I have kind of really followed intricately his journey and I feel like he does get a bad rap. But at the same time, like from your point of view, how do you kind of make sure that what you're saying and what you're putting out there, because obviously a big part of what you do is to just 
present information and, and articulate it in a digestible way, but it is you're also inevitably there's going to be times where you have to apply your perception and making sure that perception isn't being kind of muddied by your own personal experiences and is as objective as you can make it, right? Yeah, it's probably easier than you think, actually, because I do get that sort of question quite often, like, who's your favorite or whatever? And it's like, I can have favorite personalities, but when it comes to them as drivers, I generally have none because, A, you get to know each of them, like, at a certain level, and you might not like them on a personal level for any reason, just the way they treat you or whatever. They just might not be very engaging or they might not respect the media, whatever it is. Mm. But what they do in the car is incredible. And you can't then ignore how well they, they perform. Like, you know, if someone goes and wins a race, then you can't kind of go, ah, but they actually were rubbish. Like y- people will see right through that. So you have to be a hundred percent kind of honest in your appraisal of what people do on track. Uh, and just from being in it all the time, you do come across these people and get to know them. Like you start to really kind of appreciate why they are the way they are or who they are. And, and you start to have these little moments that you feel like you understand them a bit better or whatever. Mm. And even if you're not their best mate, you you can respect them. And that's what you kind of have to do. Um, and yeah, it just means I've, I've never actually had a problem with that. There's there's certain drivers that even when you know they're, they're not particularly likable uh, as people, that they still, you know, can drive a car so impressively quick that you you kind of have to go, you know, you know, they did a good job today. So um, I've never really had a, an issue with that on that front. I, I think it's it's partly luck through the sort of job I do. Like, cause you think of something like Sky and their coverage. On the yeah. whole, they're doing it for a UK audience, so they're going to focus on UK drivers. Therefore, you can understand that they get to know them better. You can see how a, whether a bias is conscious or unconscious, you know, whether they've been told to do it because that's the audience they're talking to or if they're not intending to you can see how it can come about um because i basically deal with you know i've I've written for outlets that need everyone covering or want everyone covering and they need to know about everyone you you get that kind of um time and connection with each of them and you kind of appreciate their own positions so um you see when a driver does a good job more easily or what it means to them or you see when they have a bad day why they had a bad day um Mm. you know if it's but you know if they were unlucky rather than not good and that sort of thing and i think it just uh comes quite naturally so um you you do get then on a personal level people you get on better with uh, and that's just more the ones that will um appreciate you as a human actually kind of uh i mean daniel ricardo is the obvious example of it but yeah he's the guy most likely to ask questions uh about you and your life um as you are him he, he finds it awkward that all you ever want to do is ask him questions like talk he, about me yeah <laughs> yeah exactly he sees that you, well, you're a human you've got interesting things going on and he'll yeah. talk about you um there, there's others like it too esteban ocon's very good at that actually um i had a good chat with Mick schumacher not that long ago that was a bit unexpected esteban. but yeah all, all of them like do have it in there yeah um but at, at other times like you know they're elite athletes and they also they're not doing it to be your your best friend you know so, there's sometimes you see it and you think you're being falsely nice to me just because I'm a journalist and you you hope it or you know it's easier for you to be nice but mm-hmm. it's actually very few of them now I think that's something that's changed over the last five ten years that more of the younger drivers come through are, are, are authentic uh, whether it's good or bad sometimes like Lance Stroll is pretty hard to get stuff out of certainly on the record off the record it depends the mood he's in but I've had some decent chats with him and other times where it's like I dirt on his shoe but I often like well the demands on these people the stresses on them the yeah the, the jobs they do totally understand it so um yeah you, you kind of just get that over time from dealing with everyone and i think that's what helps you stop having that kind of that level of bias and um and if the drivers then can see that you are fair they don't you don't have to be nice to them all the time but mm. if you are fair to them then they on the whole there's a few that if in the wrong moods they they can't even see that you're being fair and if you've been critical then they're not happy but on the whole they really respect it and that means that you'll never really have a problem with any of them. So, um, yeah, that just that just helps when, you, when you're in this sort of circus that's traveling around the world all the time and you do see each other a lot and they know what you've given up to cover the sport. You know, you know that they've not been home in six months. Um, mm. There's a kind of almost mutual respect there, actually, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, because I suppose like these are, you know, 20 individuals who, uh, for, for the most part of it, you know, are at the peak of their game for a reason. It takes quite an extreme level of application for anyone to get to the top of whatever they do, whether they're a sports person or, or, or anything. You have to have that extreme. You know, when when you were starting, that the the doors you were prepared to knock on and the, the the things you were prepared to do to get to where you are. But also, there's no like, there's not a one size fits all personality. You got 
Daniel Ricciardo and Kimi Raikkonen, who could not be more opposites, surely, as, as like human beings, yet their job, their application, like like this must have, this job must have taught you because you're you're meeting these people. And, and again, I'm not just talking about the drivers, I'm talking about all the other, you know, journalists and people who work in Formula One and these, you know, you know, pit crews and, and these incredibly, you know, people like, you know, the team bosses and like Adrian Newey and, and James Addison and these people who, you know, they are at the absolute top of their game. This must have taught you a lot about like the different types of human being because you're being exposed regularly to people who are operating at the absolute pinnacle. But dare I say it, and this isn't a dig at anyone in particular or meant to be uh, nasty, but you also realise that they're not necessarily the top one, two, three percent type thing. It's so much of it's circumstance or opportunities they've had. I mean, you know, if, if we talk about diversity and equality and stuff, I mean, it's still a, a white male dominated paddock. Mm. And that instantly has capped like actually how um, smart or great they might be at their jobs um, because it's not from the whole 8 billion that we've actually chosen, that sort of thing. A lot of it's built on relationships, but at the core, it's that they're all like the bit that I really take away from it is that they're all just good, hardworking human beings. And there's, there's a few that aren't, there's a few that either are just so ruthless and cutthroat and wanting to be almost famous and wanting to be at the top so much that they will screw anyone over. Um, and I do struggle like to respect them as much yeah. because the majority are just massively passionate about Formula One and racing, love what they do. Um, and you know, they're, they're, you know, they're a good human who've like you and me have got friends and family and, and a home and, and are just kind of, you know, this is their job, but it just is a job that a lot of people are very interested in. And when you see that and you genuinely just can break it right down you can sit and have a coffee with these people and chat anything. You then realise, yeah, this is this is just just a normal human being. So that actually, I find more psychologically interesting because then you see them go from that. They are that normal person that you can meet in the street and talk to, and who does a mundane thing, and then suddenly, you know, for two hours on a Sunday, and they're in the most high pressure environment, talking things that I don't understand or doing things I could never fathom. Mm. That's the bit, the the capacity to have that in there. But by being still a normal person, that's the bit I find really, um, yeah, really interesting. I mean, I, I, so to do a proper bit of name dropping, but in Qatar, we're talking about Lando and Carlos being friends. They played golf together uh, yeah. on the Wednesday before the race. And then um, myself and Lawrence from ESPN had shown up to play some golf as well um, that evening when we had a bit of a window before the race. And they were just sat on the golf buggy, like messing around. Lando's giving it this as we walk over, like jokingly, like he's good fun get on well with Carlos and his trainer as well. And um, Carlos needed to go back to the, uh, his hotel to do a Ferrari event before coming back to the golf club for some filming with Sky. Lando was like, well, I can stay here till the Sky filming. So he said he'd come and play with us. So he wanted to go out and play golf again. And, and the three of us went and played. And on that, you're just chatting away and like, it's normal stuff. He talked about playing golf with Ian Poulter and how to him incredible that was mm. because the way Poulter hits a ball and the sound it makes and his stance. And you realize that, yeah, like, there's the thing that makes someone special in what they yeah. do that blows everyone's minds because we can't do it. Me to Lando is how quickly he can drive a racing car. Um, I thought it might be how well he could hit a golf ball, but it wasn't that impressive that day. Um, <laughs> we drew and I'm not very good. So he is definitely <laughs> better. He just had a bad day. Um, but to him, it was, it was Ian Poulter's golf skills because mm. to him, he couldn't imagine being that good at it. And you realize that, yeah, that, you know, 95% of the stuff is, all the same between everybody mm. and it's the it's the five percent differentiator that is so cool um and yeah. so interesting and yeah I've, I've kind of found that across most of the paddock where um it also means that you you know there's some amazing people that just work behind the scenes that people don't know, you know yeah. that work for whether it's in communications or as mechanics or engineers or security for a team whatever it may be chefs i mean some of the chefs are great the amount of times you i mean <laughs> I, you know, I love them because they give us food, but, um, yeah, they, they, you get chatting to them and the hours they pull, um, like it's ridiculous, like triple headers and they've, the, yeah. they've got to feed the team setting up the garage. Yeah. So they've got to be there before everyone else source the food, mm. have it there so that people coming to do the early shifts are fed to get everything ready for the race weekend and then feed everyone through that, that sort of thing. Like you just don't think about it, but the sacrifices these people make, it's, mad, it's not yeah. glamorous. Um, but they're awesome people and they love their racing. So that mm. that's the connection that pretty much everyone has. Um, and yeah, that's something I actually really, really enjoy about where I am or like where um, 
I think anyone who works in the paddock, but certainly for media who get to cross across teams a lot, you get to see a lot of that. And it's, um, it's actually quite a heartwarming thing to see yeah. like the amount of passion that is in the sport, even if it doesn't always come out, um, that there's just so many huge fans of racing and formula one that are yeah. doing very, very impressive jobs. The unsung heroes behind yeah. the scenes. You think all this pressure, I do, you do think that like someone will have a crash turn one and it's like all this, all these people like went and it, and it just, it's just done. Turn one. There was like, they, they might as well not have turned up. <laughs> it's mad. Well, and yeah. Cause sometimes you like, yeah, you do make really good friends within teams. Um, quite often when your roles don't interact too much or whatever, but sometimes it is because, you know, like where's the comms teams, or whatever, get on really well with uh, a lot of them. And you, you like you'd never want to see anyone do badly because you know you have you have good relationships with everybody in every yeah. team so you always want to see them all do well which obviously isn't possible but you feel so much for them when they do have a shocker i remember being um mclaren helped me out loads i was going through some personal stuff um a couple of years ago we we're in china and um one of their team members knew what I was going through so they they were like helping out and um they told a few of their teams so they were just trying to you know um like engage me a lot chat to me uh, i ended up getting a hot lap that had suddenly fallen through last minute. I had to use it editorially still. So I didn't, it wasn't like a freebie, but I was the first person they thought of. So like, you know what, like let's put a smile on his face. Um, it was really, really nice of them. And the first lap of the race, I think they qualified quite well, but it went terribly. Both cars, I think were limping back to the pits with punches and things and they didn't score. And to see the deflation among them, it was, it was Carlos Fernando. So it was 2019. Um, remember that one. Yes. The one where Lando, the meme. Lando got like shot up. I think it's Kimi. Yeah. was in between. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then I did some work for Honda editorial work yeah. and, you know, looking at it objectively, I was like, look, Fiat didn't really do a lot wrong there. It was like mm. kind of, it was just too many cars at the start squabbling messy, mm. but the McLaren team were like livid at Fiat for <laughs> what he'd done. And I'm going, oh, it wasn't that bad, but at the same time, I felt <laughs> so sorry for them because it had, you know, their race had just ended like that and all yeah. that work and effort and time, they've flown all that way, put in all, put so much, start watching the race. And like you say, within six, seven corners. Like all the hopes they'd had of a good result before flying home for another 13, 14 hours had disappeared instantly. And yeah, the, the highs and lows for team members is just insane. Yeah, it's easy to forget how much of a team sport it truly is, Formula One, because there's all, all the emphasis is put on these 20 individuals. But actually, like, and, and that's the case, you know, whenever we talk about, oh, best car or all this this debate, it's like, yeah, but it's a team sport. It's like, you know, Ronaldo can't win it all on his own. Messi can't win it all on his own. You need that that team around you that's going to kind of help. And when you're talking about the greatest of all, that's why it will never be a cut and, you know, because it's not, it's not tennis. It's not a, you know, it's not a sport where, you know, it's just about the individual in that way. Because as much as the, the driver is the biggest cog, yeah, and they have an impact. You look at what Schumacher did to Ferrari when he joined in the, in the late nineties, like how he kind of dragged that team kicking and screaming to, to one of his most successful periods. But yeah, there's that. That's why I find super interesting, like the just the 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 amount of people behind the scenes. It's it's crazy. But also, you know, specifically to to your industry, obviously journalism, and you know, you touched on in terms of the you know the fact that Lewis, as a you know, he's come from lower middle class backgrounds. You know, he's a black kid going through the ranks and all the adversity he's come across. We know there's a lot more to be done there. And obviously the Hamilton Commission is like really interesting, actually. It's like a really good read. If you're listening and you haven't read into it, you really should. There shouldn't be this kind of like positive, they call it like positive discrimination. But then it's like, you know, but you're not accounting for all the additional barriers. The comparison I like to make is like, say you're, you're a young, say you're a boy and you really wanted to be a ballerina. Like growing up you're gonna have people tell you why are you doing this like it's not you're gonna get bullied at school you're gonna have all these factors that are gonna you know get in the way and it's like from your industry and, and being where you are now how do you feel that going forward like first you do, do you think that the problem to w what extent do you think the problem exists within kind of journalism like and what do you think is the kind of solution long term to just make sure that you know if someone if, if there's someone who's young watching listening to this like and they don't feel that they're represented amongst journalists um, or, or amongst any, you know, what are the, what are the steps towards getting a place where it is more, much more truly equal rather than just saying, oh, well, the rules aren't different for them. So technically it is equal. Yeah. It's not in, in reality, is it in society? No, I mean, I, there's definitely a problem in journalism as well. Certainly Formula One journalism um, in terms of you, if you sit in the media center and look across it, it's 99% male, white male, 
um it used to be as well like older male um it, it has had a younger influx be, i think because of the internet basically last yeah. 10 years i think it's fair to say that the average age of like the press room has dropped um and that's a lot of, you know there's some brilliant journalists and and they are older i'm not having to go at them but that was just like kind of the makeup of the press room mm. uh and and there was a few um female journalists as well and there's still a few but not many uh, and i wouldn't say it's a number that's grown over the last 10 years if anything it maybe has shrunk um and which is a shame because the, most of them were uh, brilliant writers um like and there's actually you see it certainly lewis is one some drivers really engage better with a female i don't know what it is about it i don't know if it's just that their guards down slightly more or something but you get some brilliant content and interviews and stuff because of that as well and i do think that just as humans it helps to be interacting with more people that are yeah of course definitely that are different don't they Mm. so um but yeah i mean hardly any other ethnicities are are represented in that media center and i think yeah like you said the biggest thing is is the barriers a lot earlier on i think it's something that the hamilton commission has really outlined very well and the f1 itself has said they were going to do i think um chase kerry was putting a million dollars in himself um into trying to like fund opportunities but um for placements i think it was and that was more around engineering but it does exist pretty much everywhere is that because I don't think you need a role model in every job. You know, I, I never looked at looked up to someone and was like, I want to be them as a journalist. Like, ne- never had it previously. You get you respect people as you come through and start to learn about it more. But I was never a kid going, I want to be a journalist like so and so. You, you know, the way I came about it was I loved playing sport, I wanted to be a professional sportsman. Realized not going to happen. I'm not that good at anything. What's the next best thing to do? Like, what would I love to be paid to do? And that's get paid to watch sport. Hmm. So I was like, well, what jobs actually let me do that? But it was so simple for me to think that and you know the school i was at and then the opportunities that my parents had given me to have enough backing to go to uni and to do the course at uni because i'm in a country that has those opportunities it just like you say it made the path so easy in in reality yeah those privileges that you had along the way that yeah yeah. no no one turned around and said when i said i want to be a sports journalist no one went you know be real from here how are you going to get there like this school doesn't offer mm. that opportunity or which, which university which college is going to you know say we're in america which college is going to give you that chance like and how are you going to afford to go like those sorts of barriers didn't exist for me and there there's far too many of them clearly for um different people in in life that shouldn't be facing them really if we want to change things and that's why i think it's actually further down it is a much more equal society in terms of the distribution of wealth it's 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 kind of it's why it's a or it's been a problem for so long mm. or, or you know in my view uh, i don't have all the answers by any stretch but i think it's one of the reasons it's been a problem for so long is because it's far more complex than just let's get more people you know let's just give more jobs in formula one journalism to more black people because that that works for a very short spell of time but that doesn't remove the barriers that still exist because of certain backgrounds like we need to remove those barriers and that will be costly to you know like if it was me in 20 years hopefully it'd be a lot harder for me to to do this job because the competition's going to be great as well but that only benefits everyone it means that like we said earlier about the the talent pool of the you know the top one two three percent of people from eight billion like if you are getting as many of those eight billion into that talent pool as possible then you've got to be damn good to get to the top and even if it still ten- ends up you know the the makeup of the world is such that there will be probably an imbalance in terms of um ethnicities but the the fact that those should be the best and that's why they're there mm. um and i still think we're quite a long way away from that and that's because there's still barriers in place which naturally occur because people in positions of power don't want to give it up so easily um i i think the ideas that uh, the Hamilton Commission has been coming up with is, is very positive. I think what F1 wants to do is positive. I think they need to align a lot more. Um, it's so complex that I think F1, the Hamilton Commission, the FIA, like it shouldn't be that each has their own individual kind of project. It should be, you know, club together, like make it a much more powerful entity that's trying to change things because it, it needs changing from so far down. Yeah. You need a lot of clout. Well, it's such a like, it's such a nuanced kind of, issue and you know for, for me I grew up kind of you know just you know kind of northeast London and, and I, I always grew up around like there were a lot of people from different backgrounds and, I, and I'm very kind of grateful for that being exposed to that level of kind of diversity for, throughout my, my entire life but then when you get you know like you've said that if there wasn't a problem then why are 99% of you know 
the 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 paddock in in whatever form we talk talk about journalists like why are they why are they why 99 percent male um, white males like there's clearly there's clearly a problem there if we are as you know these people the people want to say oh yeah but we're, we're yes we we are equal but then why isn't that being represented equally that's the that's the challenge but it's yeah it's so it's so like multifaceted and I, I i feel like there's a kind of yeah as much as you said you know you you don't have you didn't have you know anyone you, you looked up to but I, I think as well like you know you're now that person but there are going to be people who you know youngsters who want to get into journalism from all different backgrounds who will look at what you do and be like oh my god like I want to you know you you will be that kind of inspiration now to to people coming on um and I think that's why it's important and I'm I you know I think it's really great like how much you speak about these kind of issues as well that you know I, I think just because they don't kind of personally have a you know affect you personally as much as others it might do I think that's kind of I think it's really important I think it's it's poignant and as much as because there's a lot of talk about these things as well but seeing action is a very different thing and people talking about these things earnestly because they actually care versus talking about it because of pressure of big because of you know Lewis being so and, and Sebastian and, and be, being so open about all of these issues that surround kind of not just Formula One but the kind of society we live in right because and obviously it's your job to you know talk about that and, and convey what Lewis and, and Sebastian and what the broader sport's trying to do right yeah and, and like like I say that you don't need role models all the time I think you've got to be careful as well because there are some very good talented people from different backgrounds that that have got themselves into good key positions um and whether we're talking equality in terms of <laughs> ethnicity uh, or, or whether we're talking Obviously. about it uh yeah um or whether we're talking about it in terms of uh, male and female um, diversity because you look at some of um like the the powerful females that were in the sport but they've like some of them have disappeared over recent years i mean you look at the fact that we had two team principals that were female and, and now there's none um that sort of thing where it looks like it's going the right way and everyone's like oh good that's a nice story we'll write about it and then suddenly it's gone and no one's gone well hang on what's gone wrong um and there's um a guy sam collins who's on formula one's output i love um, sam he's great yeah he's amazing he's he is so brilliantly technically minded but just so excellent at um conveying it and explaining stuff he is one of the best journalists technical journalists out there um and he was always good at presenting and reporting anyway he did stuff uh, in japan but he never really seemed to get a shot and i do think that the kind of desire to have a more diverse presenting team led to him getting looked at more closely by formula one and they suddenly realized what a gem was there yeah and what's then i'm like well why wasn't that seen why before? wasn't that why didn't that happen earlier yeah, yeah exactly exactly because it wasn't it's not it's not a case of tokenism it's not that they've gone we can tick this box it's someone who's fully fully deserving and has been for a long time but wasn't getting that chance so then you've got to go why is that happening why, why are these people not getting those chances even when they are good enough and they're right in front of you and secondly then don't just say well look i can see um a great um tv presenter here who's who's who looks like me um and then think well then that means everything's okay because just because front of house might look quite good you know the reality might be different so uh, you know i still look at it that the predominantly male uh, sorry female roles within the paddock tend to be within hospitality and comms on the yeah. whole we've got some engineers we've got some mechanics even but nowhere near enough representation that there should be and just because there's some doesn't mean there's enough and i think it's sometimes too easy just trotted out that well, look, we have these examples, therefore we're, we're doing our bit. And it's like, no, it needs to be, basically, if it's not constantly improving, if year on year, pretty much, or over a longer period of time, mm. if it's not constantly improving, then there's still a problem. If anything, there's a bigger one because it's window dressing and not actually yeah. uh, making anything better. Actually trying to address the issue. But but I think, you know, and we'll, we'll wrap up with, because you've given me a lot of your time, Chris, so I really do appreciate it. But, but I do think as well, like, onto that that the power of you know independent creation and obviously it's something you know you know I, i've i've personally been you know had a lot of success with on, on youtube and people podcasting and and people now have the the power to to create content and put it out and, and genuinely have an opportunity and there's some there's some fantastic creators that i've you know spoken to and i've you know people i've had on the podcast and people i interact with on twitter all the time and and you know, someone like, um, I don't know if you know Steph, who's done stuff with F1 Esports and, you know, she kind of F-series and that's like mm -hmm. all female channel and, and how like the, the power of, 
you know, because with YouTube, that, you know, YouTube started where, you know, anyone can create anything and put it out there. And whether it gets picked up by the algorithm or not, you can share it and, and you can build your own empires. You look at, you know, the, the biggest creators out there. How, how do you see the independent creator platforms, not just YouTube, podcasting, wh whatever, like, and just journalism, blogging, like blogging, creating websites, like, and just using Twitter as you've got people with huge Twitter followings who don't operate and they just kind of talk about F1 and are able to build their profiles. Like, do you... Th do you think that's kind of an important part of the mixture to to change things to to enable people to be like yeah you you can just you can do it yourself you don't need to get the approval of formula 1 to talk about formula 1 you can just talk about formula 1 absolutely i mean we we've, we've got to sometimes be careful not to forget that that's still like it's it's better it's an improvement but that still is limited by can you afford the equipment can you afford mm. a laptop can you afford a microphone can you afford uh, you know a good quality camera or something can you afford the editing software if you're going to that level um uh, but it's still a much, much bigger step because you're right. It's not, it's not being gate kept in the same way as it was. Mm. Um, and I think that's, there's a, that's where the internet has been great. Um, it has its downsides in that, you know, in, if, in a sense, you say, well, anyone can have a voice and it means you can get people that, you know, misinformation that's been going around around COVID and stuff like that. Mm. And you're like, okay, it, it creates some headaches, but 90, the, the vast majority is positive in the sense that it just gives everyone their own platform and their own voice. And you know, fine, it's, it's tough to deal with sometimes if you've got so many voices coming at you, but you've got to go, well, this is a much more equal situation. Like mm. everyone is getting to either give their opinion or show their talent or try to. Um, and it's just like a bit more of an open door to much more of the world. And that's, I think, a, a really positive step. And I think the more that we get apps that allow people to do that as well, I, I like to see like, you know, Twitter spaces that have been cropping up. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the diverse nature of the people on those, actually. Um, like some of the, I went on an F1, American F11 a couple of weeks ago. And on that, it was, um, so the host was like a kind of mid 40s, I think, um, American guy on the West Coast, but then, um, you had lots of females on it. You had lots of people from different backgrounds on it. And that just suddenly, I think also then just everyone just feels part of it together. Mm. And that's a good empowerment for people to keep going, not feeling alone, not feeling like this isn't for me. Um, and also then not feel like the people that are there are going to try and stop you getting any further. Like mm. if, if someone's good at something, they, they should be getting rewarded for that. And I know that's a really simplistic view, but um, I genuinely do believe it. And, you know, in the same way that if someone's not good at it, then they shouldn't get rewarded yeah, for it, but they should exactly. try and improve and they should get the chance to improve. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't walk into my job like brilliant at it and I'm still not brilliant at it now. Mm. I'm, I'm always trying to get better and trying to improve, but I had the opportunities to learn and, and be educated to a certain way and get certain skills that other people don't get. So then when you see them off the bat on, like you say, from their own creation point of view, that, you know, maybe you go, oh, then, you know, they're not great, but well, have they had the same opportunities that I've had to do mm. stuff or that other people have had? Um, you know, are they working with the same equipment, whatever that all needs to take into account. And again, if people start to really see that, and I guess that's where we talk about a level, level playing field. If people see where it's not level, mm. if people can understand why it's not level and when they see someone producing something, it's actually, they're basically George Russell and the Williams, you know, they're putting it in Q3 because of the opportunities they've had, the, the, the stuff they've got available to them, like what they're delivering is actually well above what you know something that makes them stand out and it's if if people can recognize that i think we'll start to see see progress from it so um i think i think it is great that there's so many avenues for people to mm. just make their voice heard in different ways and as much as that might make some people uncomfortable um even myself like i said when you know i get annoyed at the way people are interpreting things on twitter or whatever that's part of everybody collectively moving forward as like as in terms of a more equal race i think yeah absolutely I, I think it's you know again with if you're giving value if if what if you're good at what you do and you're you know regardless of you know whether you've got the best equipment or you've got the nicest camera with the nicest background blur like actually if you're giving good value you know people will reward that with giving you their time to listen and consume what you're doing ultimately and, and i think that's kind of that is the that is the beauty of as long as you're giving value somewhere, they're going to be, there's going to be people who want to listen and follow what you do. Um, mm. But yeah, I think, I think Chris, I think we're going to wrap it up, mate. 
Thank it's you right. so much for coming on. <laughs> I, like, honestly, we could, like, I don't know how we've done, you know, almost two hours. This has literally flown by, man. It was so, so good having you on. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it, mate. Have you had fun? Has it been I've fun loved time? it. Yeah. Uh, even if half of them were spent with me reconnecting. So sorry about that. But, um, <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, but like you say, it was well timed as well, wasn't it? Like, we tried to get this, get this ball rolling originally and, and two bits of news drop and yeah you react to that so it's been um yeah it's been it's been a lot of fun i've really enjoyed it and, it, and it's been great to chat about so much different stuff yeah. um even, even though i am sorry to everyone that so much of it was about me um because <laughs> i um like as much as it might sound like it i don't always like talking about myself but i do love talking <laughs> about f1 and um yeah any opportunity yeah, def- well, it was because f- obviously we had Jess was the very first cool down podcast all the way back in 2020. So we've gone kind of full circle and it's the production is up Jess? a little bit. Who's, who's, who's Jess? Never heard of her. <laughs> she she, she, uh, she did come in and, and save me from uh, the dog barking and making a lot of noise actually earlier. Um, but then she's now had to be on, on kind of dog duty for the last two hours. So I better go and, uh, go and pull my weight a little Brilliant. bit. Oh, God, I'll talk to you. Have a go at me later. Right, mate, Chris, thank <laughs> yeah. you so much. And obviously, I'll link to all of your, if you want to connect with Chris, wherever. Um, and and the podcast is finished, mate. I don't really have an outro, so we're done. Oh, mega. Beautiful. Thank you very much, mate. <laughs>